All right, good evening, everybody. It's about time for us to get started. <clears throat> Thanks for taking care of that, Landon. Appreciate that. We are uh, going to start in Acts 20 uh, just briefly, and then we're going to make our way to the book of Romans. And um, I've got water here to cool us off because we're going to go so fast we might uh, not need uh... <laughs> We'll see. Uh, Acts 20... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe next quarter. <laughs> yeah, and no, I Yeah. Hey, me too. Me too. Uh all right. So Acts 20 and remember that well, you have your map, so maybe you I do. do this. All right, so what missionary journey are we on? The third missionary journey, and Paul has gone through the area of Galatia and over into Asia, and uh, he stayed at Ephesus. How long did he stay at Ephesus? Three years at Ephesus, and uh, what, what, what books did he write from Ephesus? All right, we're going to say 1 Corinthians, okay? And he writes 1 Corinthians, and then things change in Ephesus a little bit, but he hasn't heard back how things were received by uh, the Corinthians. And so he heads up, and he goes up to Troas, hoping to find Titus there and find out, well, how did things go? And he doesn't find Titus. So he moves over into Macedonia, and he finds Titus, and what's Titus's report? They took it pretty well. There's some problems. They're pretty... So then what does he do? He writes 2 Corinthians from uh, Macedonia. And uh, in that letter, he tells the Corinthians that he's planning to come visit them and to spend the winter there. And so he travels down and he comes into Achaia. And that's what we, we, we read here in Acts chapter 20 and verse uh, uh, 1. After the uproar had ceased, Paul called the disciples to himself. This is while at Ephesus, embraced them and departed to go to Macedonia. And it's from there in Macedonia that he writes 2 Corinthians. Now, when he had gone over that region and encouraged them with many words, he came to Greece and stayed three months. And uh, when the Jews plotted against him uh, as he was about to sail to Syria, he decided to return to Macedonia. That three-month period where he's in Greece or in Achaia, undoubtedly he's at Corinth. That's what he said his plans were. He wanted to stay there. So it seems that he stays the winter in Corinth. Uh, uh, yes, in Corinth. And from there, he writes the book of Romans. And so uh, that seems to fit. When we get into Romans, we'll see some of that, and, uh, and I think we can piece that together. So that seems to be the setting of, of the book of Romans, written from uh, Corinth and uh, during the winter. And I think uh, 57 A.D. Is, is the date that I have written down in my Bible, if you wanted to have a date to put with that. All right, so as we come to the book of Romans, uh, the book of Romans... It, it, it is a book that is way deeper than we will have time to plunge uh, over the next couple of lessons. Uh, and it's important because it's also a source of a lot of false doctrines. But I think the answers to a lot of the doctrines are in the context of the book itself. I don't think it's that we have to go to a ton of other passages. I think we can look at the text and see why some wrong ideas about Romans are not right. Uh, and, and so, really, I think it's right to think about the, the book of Romans as uh, the, God's plan for saving man, God's plan for making people righteous. Um, and so his goal here, I think specifically, is written to maybe directed pointedly at the Jews in the congregation at Rome, saying that God's plan for making man righteous it's, it was necessitated because of everyone's condemnation, including you, Jews. It makes people righteous regardless of where, they are, where they're from, including the Gentiles. And then he will talk about the Jews' plan, as it, as, uh, the Jews' role in, within God's plan. And then talks about really 12 through 16, I think is really focused on how do Jews and Gentiles relate to one another in light of the gospel. And there's a lot of practical applications in that 12 through 16 section. So as Paul introduces the book, he introduces himself as Paul, a servant or a slave of Christ, the King Jesus, called to be an apostle set apart for the gospel of God. And that really is going to be Paul's theme 
throughout the whole letter. So he says about the gospel, which he promised beforehand through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So from those verses, what is the gospel about? And maybe it's who is it about? Yeah, notice this. The gospel of God, uh, drop down to verse 3, concerning his son. Jesus is the focus of the gospel. He, was, he came in the flesh according to the, by the line of David, and he was exalted to the right hand of God. He was enthroned as the son of God in power by virtue of the fact that he was raised from the dead. The goal of that message, look at verse 5, to bring up through, uh, excuse me, through whom we have received grace and apostleship, to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations. That phrase, obedience of faith, shows up here and at the very end of Romans, chapter 16, verse 26. That obedience of faith, I think, is the idea of the kind of obedience that characterizes faith. It's faithful faith. It's faith that is characterized by obedience. And so whenever Paul talks about faith in Romans, let's not get the idea that somehow he's setting that in contrast to obedience because he's not. From the word go, practically, he talks about the obedience of faith in response to the fact that Jesus is the King and the Lord. And so I think that will help us a lot when we encounter some, some bad teachings about what faith is in the book of Romans. So you notice verse 7, To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. I, I want to notice a sub-theme as well. Going back to verse 5, For the obedience to the faith among who? If there was to be a city that would, would uh, be the most cosmopolitan, be the most uh, integrated in the Roman Empire, it would be Rome. And so as Paul, one of the, the sub-themes that we're going to see as we go through here is that the gospel calls from all nations to be one in Christ. Mm -hmm. And uh, that the justification for all nations comes in Christ. And uh, so you have a lot of different, you know, you got, you mentioned written maybe to the Jews there, but Rome was yeah. pre predominantly a Gentile congregation. And, uh, and, and so I think there's this emphasis, much like there was in Galatians, that what's happened is that the Lord is bringing them together. You see that in Ephesians too, that he's mm -hmm. torn down that middle wall of partition that divides, and in Christ they're brought together. So you're going to see that idea go through here that the gospel is for all. So... Yeah, anything through verse 7, did you want to make more comment? Those who are in Rome called to be saints, we, we see that appear a lot, grace and peace. Look at verse 8, and, and really down through verse 15, he talks about his relationship with them. And if, as, as you've been through the book of Romans before, you might know the answer to this without looking at it very carefully. But what does it seem to be Paul's relationship is to the Romans up until now? He's never been there. It looks like verse 10. He says, at now, at last, I might succeed, succeed in coming to you. Um, and uh, verse 13, I don't want you to be unaware that I have often intended to come to you. Uh, and then verse 14, he explains why. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. I think it's interesting here. These people are already Christians, but he wants to remind them of the gospel. Because whether you are not a Christian or you are a Christian, you still need the message of the gospel. And they needed it to solve some of the problems that they were facing. So he says, I'm eager to preach because I'm indebted. He's indebted to the Lord. So he wants to preach to Jews and to Greeks. And so he wants to come to Rome because that's the perfect place to preach to Jews and Greeks and wise and barbarians. And so verse 16, 4, because I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein, I think it's within the gospel, is revealed the righteousness of God. That is God's way of making man's righteous. From faith to faith, even as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now there's a lot in those two verses, but I think we could say those are the theme verses in some ways of the book of, of, book of Romans. 
that Paul wants to, as, as Lonnie had on the board, set forth God's plan for making man righteous, which is the gospel. Why do we need it? How does it work to whatever degree we can grasp how does it work? What are its implications for the Jews? What are its implications for all of us as we live and work together? And so God's power to salvation is the gospel. That last statement, the just shall live by faith. So that, that's a quote from the Old Testament. When you think of the Old Testament law, do you think of justification or, uh, or, or being, being acquitted? Do you think of that as happening by faith or trust? Not in the old law, you don't think of it, but that's exactly what the old law said. And so I think Paul starts off with this saying, you understand that the, 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 the fulfillment of all the hope of the Old Testament is found in the gospel as well. Mm -hmm. And so he's going to build upon that as he continues through here. Verse 16, kind of a theme verse yeah. in many ways. It's the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. Everyone who believes. And uh, so he's going to build on that as well. Yeah, just a word about what you were saying about Habakkuk 2 verse 4. I think Paul's point is that the law was, was always effective, or when it was effective, it was effective because it was built on faith. Mm -hmm. right? Abraham, and we're going to see this in chapter 4, was justified because he would do whatever God said. The Israelites who were justified were going to be justified because they trusted God and were willing to do whatever he said. The law was not the be-all, end-all of that. It was built on top of faith. It wasn't that faith was added on later. And Habakkuk shows us that faith was right at the heart of it. And, and, and really, the word in, in Habakkuk could be faithfulness. And I think that really gets the idea there. Any questions, comments? Oh, sorry. No, no. Uh, 317, any, 17. any questions, comments? That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yes. So he's going to spend, I, I, think, uh, the, I think he's going to spend a lot of it talking about that this idea. And when we think of faith, it, it's, it's obviously not just saying, oh, I acknowledge mm -hmm. that that's true. Uh, it, it's the idea of a loyalty to, mm -hmm. a commitment to in that. And so we'll see that. And he's going to really build on that in chapter 6. You know, that what, what faith is, is it's, uh, it's dedicating your life to the Lord in that. So that's a very good point. So there will be a word that shows up several times, especially in chapter 3, that will ask about the faithfulness of God. You know, it's the exact same word. So when we talk about God's faith, we're not talking about whether or not He believes in us. We're talking about His faithfulness to us. Well, it's the same word that's used to talk about our faith, our loyalty, our devotion to Him. So He's been devoted to us. How should we respond? And I think that might be the idea of that from faith for faith is because of God's faithfulness as demonstrated in Christ produces our faithfulness because that's always been the way that it was. The just will live by faithfulness. The just will live by faith. So maybe a synonym in Romans could be like allegiance or loyal, loyalty or fidelity or something like that. I think that would help us. And it would get us away from the ideas of like belief is somehow opposed to obedience because it's obviously not for Paul uh, based on verse 5 and other passages in Romans. Well, it's just like the scriptures where it says faith is without works. Yes, dead. absolutely. So you have all the faith in the world, but if you don't act on it, it's useless. I mean, right. it's dead. That's right. So... The first thing that Paul's going to nail down for us is why justification is needed. And he's going to start off in verse 18. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against what? Godliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. The wrath of God is revealed. Okay, what's God capable of doing to you? <laughs> This is the most powerful being ever. <laughs> and, uh, and if his wrath is against you, you're in trouble. Well, why is it revealed? Well, it's revealed against unrighteousness and ungodliness. And then he's going he's gonna to just kind of tell man's history. And I think he's looking at the world as a whole, which would predominantly be Gentiles. And he goes through and he says, you know, because what may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has shown it to him. Since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes have been clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead. So they are without excuse. So everybody has the opportunity to recognize that this higher being should be reverenced and honored. But what's happened is, although they knew God, Step number one, they did not glorify him as God, nor were they thankful, but they became futile in their thoughts and their foolish hearts were darkened. Step two, 
professing to be wise, in other words, their pride, they fall in love with their own wisdom, they became fools. And they changed the glory of the incorruptible God into an image. Step three, like corruptible man and birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. So here's the progression. First, I quit being thankful and acknowledging God. Second, I start saying, you know what? I've got some pretty good ideas myself. Third, then I begin to ascribe praise and worship to the, the creation rather than the creator in this. And so what does the creator do? Why were we made? What were we made for? To worship, to worship and honor. And yet we're not doing that now. So what does God do? God says, okay, you want to follow your own ways? Verse 24, therefore God gave them over to uncleanness, or gave them up to uncleanness, in the lust of their hearts, the dishonor of their bodies among themselves. And he goes through and he lists this list of, of transgressions here. In verse 26, for this reason, God gave them up to vile passions. And verse 28, as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind. And so he goes through and he begins to list these things, such as the idolatry, the sexual immorality, and then he lists this list of things, covetousness and maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, evil-mindedness, backbiters, whisperers, haters of God, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. This is terrible. Well, this is what humans have done. Who, knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who do the same. All right. So, when you look at the pagan world, this is what you see. What do you think the Jews thought about the pagan world? A lot of them disliked it, but a lot of them were guilty of all this stuff yep. that was there. That's chapter 2. Chapter 1, he's putting it on the Gentiles, and you know what the Jews would be saying? That's mm. right. God's wrath is going to come upon them because of all of this wickedness. And that's the first thing that Paul hammers down. That's right. They're guilty of it. They're worthy of it. They deserve it. Then he's going to turn it around in the second chapter. Yeah, so in verse 2, he says, uh, We know that, uh, well, it, verse 1, For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So I want you to notice that first phrase, Therefore you have no excuse. Remember back in 1 verse 20? Uh, 1 verse 19? They had no excuse. They are with, so this end of verse 20, For they are without excuse. You have no excuse. Well, what man? Verse 2, we know that the judgment of God falls rightly on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the right riches of his kindness? Does presuming sound like being ungrateful? Mm -hmm. Of the rich of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath. What was coming on the Gentiles? Wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. So they did not give thanks. They were without excuse. God's wrath was revealed against them because they knew, we know, verse, verse 2, we know, we know, but they practiced those same things. They took God's patience as validation of their wickedness, and it was not. Uh, and, and, and so they stood condemned even as the, as the Gentiles did. So in verse 6, he will render to each one according to his works. Each one, everybody, Jew or Gentile. Every, so you don't get any special credit. You don't get extra credit because you got the law. Because he renders people according to their works. Yes, the Gentiles stand justly condemned, but I really think the target is pointed at the Jews and say, you need to understand that you're right down there with them. Uh, because everybody would have agreed that the Gentiles were kind of, uh, that they had rejected God. But the Jews might not think that about themselves. And he wants them to see you are in the exact same boat that they are, and, and, and that boat is, uh, well, it's sunk. Um, so, <laughs> verse 9, there will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil. The Jew first, and also the Greek. But glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. The Jew first, and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. Don't think your national identity will give you a special uh, release, a special escape from judgment. It won't. Because it's about what you do 
in response to what God has done for you. They're without excuse. You're without excuse. What are you going to do with that now? So God's wrath is revealed against all ungodliness, unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. Verse 11 of chapter 2, there's no partiality with God. So that's true of the Gentiles, of the Jews as well. Any thoughts, comments through, through chapter 2, verse 11? exactly right they despise the goodness and forbearance of the lord in that very good any other thoughts all right so uh looking at verse 12 as many as have sinned without the law also perish without the law so if you sin what's the what's the punishment you perish as many as have sinned in the law will be judged by the law. And what did the law do? Well, it condemned you uh, to perish. If for not the hearers of the law are just in the sight of God, but the doers of the law will be justified. And so uh, the Jews here, well, we have the law. Yeah, but what if the Gentiles actually behave themselves more according to the law than you do? Is just having the law some, some type of merit in and of itself? No, absolutely not. So he deals with that. For if Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things contained in the law, they are a law unto themselves. And, uh, but now here's the thing. He makes this point because sometimes the question comes up, well, what law were the Gentiles under? We don't have a record of it. There's not a record law. What did God hold them accountable for? Well, he makes this point. He says, who show the work of, their written, the, of the law written on their hearts in the con their conscience bearing witness and between themselves, uh, between their, themselves, their thoughts accusing or excusing them in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So let's say we don't have the law of Moses. We don't have the, the, the testimony given to us. Do you think that there were Gentiles anywhere that didn't have some standard that they believe they should live by? Do you believe that any of them who had some standard by which they thought they should live by ever felt like, I have never in any way violated the standard? It was probably some that thought that way, but when it actually all comes down, when they're actually standing before God, depending on whether it's before Christ or even up till today, it's going to be God's judgment on whether or not that they can enter in or not. And we don't have the responsibility of them because we can't see the hearts of the men or how he thinks about it. It's his decision on what's going to happen to these. But what he's telling, Paul's telling the people now, he said, you know, you've got the law and you've had it all these years and you still disobey it to the point that you're actually wickeder than the ones that you are saying that the, the, the Gentiles that are wicked that you always point the finger at. That's right. I think what he's saying in this section in particular is there's nobody who doesn't recognize that they violated some standard that they, that they agree with. Yeah, unless they're not all right. Yeah, that's right. I mean, like, like, like I'm sure there's somebody, I'm sure there's somebody somewhere. But he's saying the Gentiles recognize they're guilty. Maybe not. They don't. They don't turn over to to Leviticus and say, okay, well, this is the this or, or, or Exodus and say, here's the command that I disobeyed. But they have a guilty conscience. They have a guilty conscience. They have a standard. What's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. That's right. That's mm -hmm. right. And so, so what's the point? Everybody recognizes they've fallen short. And, uh, and there's a, an understanding of that. So if that's the case, he's building this case here. Which one of us is going to be justified before God? Because it's like, I've done it just like I was supposed to. Not even the Gentiles would say that. And so that's the case that he's building up to this point. Yeah. So then you have in verse 17. But if you call yourself a Jew 
and rely on the law and boast on God and know his will and approve what is excellent because you are instructed from the law. And if you are sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, an instructor of, a, of the foolish, a teacher of children, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and truth. That's what the Jews were supposed to be, right? Light to the nations. A, a, a royal priesthood. People who could instruct the nations in the law of God. Verse 21. You then who teach others, do you not teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? You who say that one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob, rob temples? You who boast in the law, dishonor God by breaking the law. For as it is written, the name of God is blasphemy among the Gentiles because of you. You are supposed to be the ones, you presume to be the ones who are the instructors of the law. But actually, by your breaking the law, you make God's name look worse than the Gentiles do. Because you are the ones who are supposed to know better. And they, they don't. All right. So uh, what, was, what was circumcision? What was it supposed to symbolize? The covenant between mm -hmm. God and Abraham. Yep. And, and it came to represent these are God's special people. Well, are they behaving like God's special people? Okay, so just because they're circumcised in the flesh, what does that mean? Not much. Not much. So he makes that your circumcision has become uncircumcision. Well, if that's the case, then is it possible that those who are uncircumcised could actually be right in God's sight even though they weren't physically circumcised? That's exactly right. And so he's building this case, I think, for the Jews. You said maybe it's written in front of him to the Jewish Christians there in Rome. That they're thinking, well, the Gentiles just, they just can't be right in God's sight because they're not circumcised, they haven't had the law and everything. Well, wait a minute. Yes, they're condemned, but you're condemned too. So if you could be justified in some way, perhaps they could be too. And so how would that take place? Yeah. So when somebody hears this and they say, and so by the, end, by the time you get to the end of chapter 2, you've got the Gentiles condemned and the Jews condemned, and somebody might say, well, what's the point? Why did God do all of that? What's the point of being a Jew? And so verse 1, then what advantage has to do? Or what is the value of circumcision? Much in every way. To begin with, the Jews were entrusted with the oracles of God. You had it in your hands. You knew the will of God. When you know There were people who were wondering, who were groping, as Paul will say in Acts 17. You had it. You had information from God. What if some were unfaithful? Does their faithless, uh, faithlessness nullify the faithfulness of God? By no means... Let God be true, though everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. Uh, the idea there is, well, what if people violate the law? Does that make God's promises null and void? Does that make his commitments null and void? No. God is true. And actually the quote there in, in verse uh, 4 comes from David's confession. David prays and confesses his sin that you may be justified in your words, that you would be the one who would always be shown to be right when you speak. Any, any thoughts through uh, maybe verse 8? I think that, uh, and I may not be understanding your question, I would say yes, the, the Jews should, they were without excuse for his glory was seen. His invisible attributes were clearly seen, but they did not glorify him as they were supposed to. So they were without excuse for not worshiping. Now, in what way was he to be worshiped? I, I don't know what specifications were given to them on that. Does that, does that help you? Is that, is that your question, I guess, is what I'm saying. Right. I was just wondering, I mean, if they meant for you right and wrong, if they were taking credit in that case, mm -hmm. would they have meant for no no worship? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I think when he says did they naturally know right and wrong, I think I don't know that he's saying they had all the details down. Yeah. I, I think I think he's saying everybody has that kind of gut feeling. There is some standard and sometimes it happens to align with God's will and they know that even in the places that they know about, they haven't kept it. Now about worship, I think that Paul is saying in Romans 1 that they should have known something about the true God and worshiped him appropriately, whether they, they suppress the truth. And I, don't, I think 
I think over, a, over time, they may have forgotten what they naturally knew because they had been pressing down that mm-hmm. truth for so long. But, you know, sometimes we use Romans 1 to make the argument like atheism is, is, doesn't make sense. You know, just look around at the natural world. We're that excuse. But he was using that to argue against idolatry. He was saying, if you recognize that this world was made by somebody much grander than you are, then you cutting down that piece of wood and worshiping that is dumb. You know, and I think he's trying to get them to see that as much as we use that passage to talk about atheism or something else. So I think they should have drawn the conclusion that the worship that they were in, engaged in with idols and things like that was not, was not right. Now, what the details would be about what they were supposed to do, I, don't, I mean, they couldn't come in the temple. Uh, but, um, you know, I don't know. Mm-hmm. But here, this is leveling the whole playing field here. Uh, Paul is establishing that all are condemned and all are in need of God's grace. That's right. You know, nobody stands above anybody. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And by, so when we get to verse nine, so are the Jews any better off? What is his answer? No, not at all. Couldn't be much plainer than that. And he goes through this passage, verses ten through eighteen, and he's quoting from their law. He's quoting a lot from the Psalms and the words of David here. And sometimes, so none is righteous, no, not one. And sometimes people have gone to this passage and say, look, there's nobody who's righteous, not even, not even people who have responded faithfully to the Lord are righteous. You're completely evil. You're totally depraved. That's not what the context of those passages is saying. In those passages, David is saying, I'm righteous. The people who have rejected God, among them, there's not one righteous. And I think the point that he's making is, you can't reject God's law and still claim to be righteous. And your own law says that. And you might think that you can, because you're circumcised or because you keep the Sabbath or whatever it is that you do, that you can reject these other aspects of God's law and still be his person, and you can't be. There's none righteous among those who reject God and his will. And so you come to verse 19. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Do you think David was writing those psalms for Gentiles? Not at first, right? He was writing them for the Jews to read and to understand so that every mouth may be stopped. You know, put their hand over their mouth because there's not a word they can say in in contradiction to what the law says. And the whole world may be held accountable to God for by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So kind of the, the verdict that's rendered is you've got the law, but you will not be righteous by keeping of the law because every one of us stand condemned by sin and the law says so. So one of the great advantages of having the law was that you were, had, had the best shot of recognizing your condition. Mm-hmm. Because what did, what did the law do? What did the Old Testament do? You, you've got a lot of precepts there. And people look at, at the Levitical law in particular and go, whew, Boy, can you imagine having to do all of that? Okay, well, what would it show you? Failure. Failure. I failed. I failed. I failed. I failed. Okay, well, what do I need to do? How can I be justified? And what was the answer in the law? So one of the things of the answer of the law was at that time before Christ came, was they'd go to the temple and make offerings, and those burnt offerings would roll it forward. But couldn't take it away. The blood of bulls and goats was not sufficient. So what the law sets up is a system where we understand our guilt and and our judgment, our just judgment, but it doesn't set up a proper solution. So what does it leave us longing for? Something more. There's got to be something more. And that's the purpose of the law. About the law. So if you look at the sacrifices in Leviticus, and, and I'm not sure that I have all this straight in my mind, but... Most of the sacrifices, I think all of them, say that they make an exception and they say, unless it's a high-handed sin, right? a sin where you knew what you were doing and you just went right into it. So the sacrifices, for the most part, were things like, I didn't know or I did on accident. So think about David, and we're going to talk about David in chapter 4. He, uh, did David not know that it was wrong to commit adultery with Bathsheba? I think it was high-handed. Did he not know that it was wrong to put Uriah on the front lines and then make everybody back? I think it was high-handed. What sacrifice is there in the law that would forgive David? I don't think there is one. And I think that's what he wants the Jews to see, 
is the sins that you're guilty of, we're not just talking about, oh, I didn't know, and so I can go and make it safe. You've been high-handed in this. It's been in, because of your pride that you have done this. And as a result of that, they're done, not only is the blood of bulls and goats insufficient for all the sin, there wasn't even provision in the law for the kinds of sin you've been engaged in. And so David was going to have to depend on the grace of God. Abraham had to depend on the grace of God. You are going to have to depend on the grace of God because the law is insufficient. And that's what he's going to say in chapter uh, 3. Really, I think 3, 21 through 26, if we could have a, a runner-up for key text in the book of Romans, I, I think this one would be it. And, and it's a little bit uh, more spelled out here because he says, now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. The righteousness of God. Here I take that phrase to be God's way of making man right. right? We see that God is righteous in the old law. But how he's going to make us right is revealed apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, they point to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his gift, uh, grace as a gift of the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So the question that we have as we come to the end of chapter 3, or really 3 verse 20, is, okay, everybody's unrighteous. There's not one righteous. No, not one. How can God be righteous, calling you and me righteous, when there's not a single one of us that actually are righteous? And what's the answer? Christ. The blood of Christ is the means by which, verse 26, God can be just and the justifier of the one who gives his allegiance, puts his faith in Jesus. He, his blood was the propitiation. It was the atonement. It paid for the debt of our sin so that we can be just and God can be righteous in declaring it just because the price was paid in Jesus. Now, if that's the case, verse 27, then what becomes of our boasting? Anybody want to boast? <laughs> I'm proud of my... No. It eliminates it. it. It obliterates it. By what kind of law? By law of works? No. But by the law of faith. By the rule that if we're going to be justified... It's going to come because we've given our allegiance to Jesus, not because we have somehow met the standard that God had set, because we have not. Yeah, so this uh, verse 27, by what law of works? No, but by the law of faith. You're going to see this idea, the law. And, and you, you can kind of get a definition of it in this passage. Mm -hmm. By what system? Mm -hmm. By the system of, of legal justification? No but by a system of trust and, and, and dependence upon. That's how we find our justification. And so if you'll keep that definition in mind, it'll answer a lot of the questions that sometimes are brought up about, uh, you know, well, there's, there's, you, you say that we have to do something. No, you know, we're not under the law of works. No, the, the law of works is a system of works that we're justified by. We're, we can't be justified by that. And so that, that little definition, uh, seeing that here in this verse, helps me the rest of the book to stay clear on what Paul's trying to say. Does that make sense? You following what I'm saying? Uh, yeah, there's, yes, I, 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 okay. I'm following what you're saying. Right. So, uh, I'm it, glad. It, One it, person it, in here has. <laughs> yeah. Um, we, we can't be justified by works because we've broken the law, right? If, if I murder somebody and I, I stand in court and, and the judge says, You've, you're guilty of this. And I say, well, there are 7.2 billion people I haven't murdered, right? Well, I'm not, I'm not relieved because I haven't broken those. I'm guilty because I've broken the one. And that's what, that, that's what uh, that makes us incapable of being justified by standard works. And I think there may be some disagreement here, but I, I think that primarily he's talking about the law of Moses. Those are the people he's trying to address, that they think they are justified because they have met these. And see, the thing is, is they've doctored the law to make it fit what they're already doing, and then say, well, look how righteous we are. And I think Paul is saying, but you're missing a whole lot of what the law requires. You're not, you're not living, you said earlier, um, 
the one great benefit of the law was it, it shined a spotlight on sin. And we might not see that as a benefit, but it was. It was you could recognize, I desperately need God's grace. That's not how they used the law, though. Instead, they created a measuring tape out of the law that was exactly their height. And they put it up against themselves and they said, well, look at me. I'm pretty righteous. And, uh, and they, had, they had used it as a tool for displaying their own righteousness or in boasting in their own bloodline. We are the people of God because we do these things. We, we, we're circumcised. We, we keep the, were those things important? Of course they were important. But the law was on the basis of whatever I say, obey me. And they said, all you have spoken, we will do, and we will be obedient. Exodus 20 and 19 and 24. But that's not how they treated the law. You can go to Jeremiah and read about that. Jeremiah says, did I ask for sacrifices on the day you came out of Egypt? No, what I asked for was your hearts. And, and that's what he wanted. The sacrifices were important, but they weren't the main thing. Obedience was the main thing. So we come to chapter 4, and he's going to use two great examples of justification that comes by grace through faith. The first one is Abraham. Remember the scripture says that Abraham believed God. This is Genesis 15. And God counted it to him. He credited it to him righteousness. He called Abraham righteous. He made him righteous because Abraham believed him. Now, when in the timeline, do you remember, did I say what chapter? Genesis, what chapter it does, is that passage in? 15, very good. Genesis 15, 6. What does that very obviously come before? Do what? The offering of Isaac, that's true. What about chapter 17? You know what chapter 17 is about? Circumcision. Circumcision. And it's about, what, 430 years before the law. So was Abraham justified? The text says he was. The text says God called him righteous without circumcision and without the law. That's pretty important. Now, when we talk about Abraham being justified by faith, we are not talking about Abraham being justified just because he mentally acknowledged that God existed or even just because he said, yes, I accept your promise. By chapter 15, he's left his homeland. He's offered worship in several different places where he stopped. He has made tremendous commitments to God along the way. And it will be said again in chapter 22 after he offers Isaac. And James will use this exact passage and say, you see, it's not that a man is justified by faith apart from works. He's justified uh, that Abraham, when he offered Isaac, his works fulfilled his faith. They, they brought to completion the faith that he had demonstrated. So we're not talking about an, an inactive faith. We're talking about a living faith. An obedient faith, an allegiant faith that, that uh, Abraham had given to the Lord. Well, maybe, maybe he was justified just because he was already really righteous already. Mm -hmm. Well, the second illustration is going to be David. Look at verse 5. But to him who does not work but believes on him who, is just, who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted to him for righteousness. All right, and again, this is one of those places where somebody says, See, see who does not work. You don't have to do any work. Well, again. What are we talking about here? We're talking about justification by a system of works, mm -hmm. that somehow the salvation was earned by works. What about David? Would you say, well, David earned his salvation. No, we have some glaring, glaring uh, sins of David. And so just as David also describes the blessedness of the man whom God imputes righteousness apart from works, in other words, David couldn't say, God, I've been so righteous before you, I've never sinned. He couldn't do that, so what does he say? Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whom the Lord does not impute sin. David realizes if I'm going to be just in God's sight, it's going to have to be because he forgives me. It can't be because I've done so great, because I haven't done so great. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so as you look at verses 9 through 12, this is why he says it depends on faith. Verse 12, and to make him the father of the circumcised who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. The reason God did it the way he did it was so that Abraham could be the father, not just of the Jewish bloodline, but of Jew and Gentile, those who would 
place their confidence, give their allegiance uh, to him. Uh, I think we're going to have to stop, I'm, I'm afraid. Uh, we got a minute. Any, yeah. any comment that you would like to make about anything that we've covered this far that we haven't given you time to make? So we'll pick up in the middle of chapter four next time. Lord willing. Thanks for watching. If you found this video to be beneficial, please follow us on Facebook or subscribe to our YouTube channel. Feel free to share it with others that you feel like may benefit from it. If you need to contact us, please contact us via email at quinn.church at yahoo.com. Also, if you're in the area, we would love for you to come visit with us at one of our assemblies. Have a good day.